and uh, welcome all of you who are here and all of you who are here through cyberspace. So uh, good to have you all with us. Um, there is a, um, after the service, there will be food and coffee in uh, the hall down the uh, hall. And, um, and I'm going to be sitting in the corner with a cup of coffee to talk about the service if anybody wants to talk about uh, what we're uh, going to be talking about today in terms of holiness and happiness. Um, with that, uh, we have a number of things going on. I'm filling in for Pastor Heather as uh, she's on renewal leave uh, for the next few weeks. And there's going to be a series on happiness and, and, and uh, joy uh, over the next few weeks. And it's a topic that uh, requires more than just one Sunday to, to cover. With that, if you'll join me in the call to worship, please rise as you are able. Sing to God a brand new song. He's made a world of wonders. He rolled up his sleeves. He set in his life. God made history with salvation. He showed the world what he could do. Shout out your praises, God, everybody. Let loose and sing. Strike like a man. Round up an orchestra to play for God. And a hundred voice choir. Feature trumpets and big trumpets. Fill the air and praises to King God. Set the sea and its fish with a round of applause. With everything living on earth joining in. Let ocean strangers call out on the war and mountains harmonize and out. Please join in singing, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, Hymn 89.
We know that you are our God. You made yes. us and not we ourselves. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture. We enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. We are thankful to you. Bless your holy name. For you are good, your mercy is everlasting, and your truth endures across all generations. Amen. Please be seated. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keep faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Praise God. Please join and join in singing, I'll praise my maker, maker while I breath, hymn number 60.
temple and he has told the parable of the wicked tenants. He has discussed paying taxes and also the question about the resurrection. And all these things he has really caused the authorities some difficulty. Continuing with verse 28. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. This is the word of God for the people of God. Back in the days of the early Methodist circuit riders, the circuit riders would travel around and stay with people at night. And in one case, uh, up in upstate New York, uh, it was winter, snowing, and a gentleman came to the door of this house. And they were used to having circuit riders stay with them, and so they let the circuit rider in. And in the afternoon, they spent the rest of the day sitting by the fire, singing, telling stories, and this older man, the circuit rider, was just an enjoyable individual bringing more than just himself into the room. Now there was a young girl there, around 11, 12 years old, and she observed him just being himself. And she noticed that, you know, he, he didn't have much more than what he carried with him. He uh, came in the middle of a storm in the winter. He uh, basically spent the time sharing himself with him. And finally, she couldn't contain herself anymore, and she said, old man, why are you so happy? <laughs> and he looked at her, and he said, because I'm a Methodist. <laughs> if you look at the first, uh, at the top of the bulletin, um, Matthew 5, 8, in, in the centering prayer, it says, Happy are those whose hearts are pure, for they shall see God. Now, you may be used to a different version of that text that says, Blessed. And as I have on my shirt here today, saying blessed. We are all blessed. We can say that because blessed is just, uh, has, a, has is, is a number of words that are synonyms for essentially the same thing. Whether you say happy, whether you say joyful, whether you say blessed. These are all synonyms. Glad uh, is another one. These are all terms that are used in various translations of the Bible to infer a, a enjoyment of being with God, enjoyment of being part of God's world. Now, when John Wesley started the Methodist movement, one of the things he said very early on was he had looked through all the New Testament and, and basically what he said, the basic message of the New Testament is God is love. And that it is in that loving spirit that if you are in love, 
you probably have it. Most people who meet someone, whether in a relationship, um, you, you have a spouse or some other relationship and you're in love, it's usually a happy relationship as it goes on and you learn more about each other. And that's, and that's the case in terms of what Wesley taught. He talked about various levels of grace in terms of our, how we learn about God. How we have, in, in its first instance, God pursuing us. God wanting to have a relationship with us. Having that loving relationship. And then, and then God, in terms of forgiving us for past deeds. We are in a world where we are trying to in, get forgiveness for what we have done in terms of our relationship with God. And then a third form of grace is the sanctifying grace, where we become more loving, more like Christ. And that is the uh, structure that Wesley provided in terms of how we grow in grace in terms of the church. Early on uh, in the Wesley's formation of the Methodist uh, movement, he had a meeting with the head of the Moravian church, Count Zinzendorf, a Ger German. And since Wesley could not speak German, and Zinzendorf could not speak English, they, they communicated in Latin. And, and Wesley records this in his journal, and, and he, he has this conversation about how Zinzendorf saw religion. And Zinzendorf basically uh, told Wesley, well, asked him that, uh, what, what's this new religion that you have felt formed? And Wesley said, new religion? There's, I don't have a new religion. And, and, and Zinzendorf said, well, I've read things that you have written, and, and basically, um, you, you, have, you talk about uh, effectively this happiness uh, things, and that um, you, you reject that um, um, we are sinners in terms of that we are miserable sinners. And I call this the Sisyphus Christianity. That every day you wake up a sinner, a miserable sinner, and your job is to push that rock. If you remember the, the myth of the punishment that this individual is going to push a rock up the hill every day, and then after the end of the day, the rock rolls down the hill, and next day you start off exactly where you were. And, and, and what Zinzendorf said is, we're all miserable sinners. Even the best of us are miserable sinners. And essentially, we start out each day a miserable sinner, and we push our rock up the hill, and the next day, it's back at the bottom of the hill. Now, that's not what Wesley thought. And in this conversation, Wesley says, you don't think that people are, in fact, forgiven? And, 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 and he says, uh, Susan Dorf, representing what was the predominant view of the time, whether it was predestination or what have you, he says, no, that, that we are all miserable sinners. Now, if that's your view of life, it's awfully hard to be happy. Um, and what Wesley taught was, yes, we, we, we need a relationship with God, a, a loving relationship. And it's through that loving relationship that we find our happiness with God. It is that relationship, um, as written by uh, Paul Wesley Choka, the important thing to the Wesleys was that in this concept of Christian life, faith leads to love, and to be loving or holy is to be truly happy. So, that relationship. So when, when John Wesley taught about sanctifying grace and 
and going on to perfection, what he was talking about was leading a life of all love. That if you are in love, if you love God, if you love your neighbor, then you will be happy because that is what comes out of that kind of relationship. And it's important in terms of our church that sometimes we don't see that lovingness uh, in our church community or in, in what the church is doing. And maybe that if we spend more time on focusing on that loving relationship, then that happiness would be seen by others. Now it's important, I mean, we often think of our Declaration of Independence and, and how we talk about that uh, when Jefferson wrote the terms that life, liberty, and happiness, it's important to understand this is a derivation of John Locke's earlier in the century talking about life, liberty, and property that that was the basis of natural law. That we, that in, in essence, we were moving away from the time of authoritarian rule, of kings and queens ruling everything and, and making all decisions in terms of, of, of nations. And that we were gonna change in the 18th century to a different form of government in, in terms of John Locke put that in terms of life, liberty, and property, that it was important to be able to own property and control that. When Thomas Jefferson was doing the Declaration of Independence, he moved away from that property base and, and talked in terms of happiness, that we were pursuing happiness, not the day-to-day -day responsive to everything that is going on, but how we live life. We're seeking a better life. And so that is more of what John Wesley, also a preacher of the 18th century, meant when he then described Methodism as the old religion, the religion of the Bible, the religion of the primitive church. This religion of love and joy and peace has in its seat in the, the inmost soul, but it is ever showing itself by its fruits. Wesley wrote in his publication an earnest appeal to men of reason and religion in 1744 by its fruits, spreading virtue and happiness all around it. Now, you can call that joyfulness, you can call that gladness, any number of death of words that you can substitute for, for that. But what was in the essence of what Wesley was, was preaching was that it is love that is the basis of it. And through love that we, we find this happiness. I, I often find that the uh, Methodist uh, <coughs> church ha has a, uh, you know, a vision a, uh, our, our, what we're supposed to be trying to do is make disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and that term make bothers me. Uh, because I would substitute make with the word woo. I would want us to be wooing people into the arms of Christ. Into the loving arms of Christ. It is wooing people so that they are finding something that they can relate to. That they're happy about. That they're part of. And it's, it's through if you've ever been in a relationship and, and you have someone that you're in love with and you're trying to be your best, the term woo becomes much more what you're doing. You're trying to be your best and you're trying to win them over. And I think winning people over to Christ, wooing people, is what we ought to be doing. We ought to be in terms of our church programs, in terms of activities, whether it's the poor, whether it's people who are in need, the folks coming over from Af Afghanistan or um, other parts of the world, it is showing them what we have. Now they have their own religion. We're not necessarily trying to convert them, but we are trying to show 
our love, our engagement in the world. And so it is, it's critically important that we move away from, uh, and Wesley taught, that it is not a case of being uh, sinners every day and pushing our rock up the hill. What we're doing is climbing the mountain. And the rock doesn't blow it down. Now, we may backslide. We, there may be some areas of the mountain that uh, are loose stones or whatever, and we may slide down, but we pick ourselves up and we keep climbing. And I think it's important to understand that as we climb, this is part of the sanctification, part of uh, seeing the vistas that one sees as you climb the mountain. And that's the message that Wesley, and certainly if you've ever climbed the mountain and looked out over the vistas that you see, it brings a smile to your face. It, it, it is heartwarming. It, it is something that makes you happy. And it is that sense of life that is what Wesley means when he says holiness and happiness. Many times you'll see it's one or the other that sometimes you see in the press or elsewhere that it is, you know, somehow we can't be both holy and happy. But I think that what Wesley taught was you can't. And, and that is what the reality is in terms of our living, uh, our Methodist tradition. But it's not just climbing mountains. It is everyday activities. Paul Chilka, who, who teaches uh, or has been teaching at, at Duke uh, uh, theology, uh, wrote a paper on worship and, and uh, uh, evangelical uh, activities, evangelism. And he talks about meeting a, a, a famous theologian uh, who, who was German, uh, and his name was Jürgen Moltmann. Now, Jürgen was, re was responsible for developing a, 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 a sense of the theology, the theology of hope that, in essence, having something positive in front of you is so important in terms of understanding God. So he was studying at Duke, uh, Choka, and had the opportunity to meet Moulton Jordan. And he um, sat down with him and explained that he was working on his doctorate under the leadership of uh, 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 Frank Baker, another famous Wesley scholar. And, and, and he explained this to Moulton and Moulton says, wait, 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 I have a story to tell you about Baker. And he says, back during World War II, Baker was the pastor of a small Methodist church up in the northeast of England. Small place. And he had heard that there was a German uh, prisoner of war camp nearby. And so he approached the authorities and said, I would like to invite a German prisoner of war to come to my home each Sunday. And that over time, I would meet a number of them, but I would share with them, you know, my faith and, and talk with them about theirs. So the authorities agreed, and, and, and every Sunday, he would go over to the prisoner of war camp, pick up a different individual, and bring him over to his home for lunch. And, and part of the discussion that he and his wife, uh, Nellie, uh, uh, engaged in. At this point, Moulton said, and one of those prisoners of war was named Jürgen Moulton. And it was through that lunch with Baker and his wife that he then found 
his religion, his belief in this theology of hope, that there was in fact something ahead of him. Being a prisoner of war is not a easy thing and certainly separated from your own country and having your country being destroyed to a large extent by the war. It was at lunch with a Methodist preacher in the northeast of England that put him on the track to become the theologian that he became. As he puts it, I want you to know that the seed of hope was planted in my heart around Frank and Nellie Baker's Sunday dinner table. Then Paul Choco goes on and writes, the Bakers lived the integral nature of worship and evangelism. I am absolutely sure that if you asked them, what are you doing, Frank or Nellie would have said, well, we are simply doing what Christians do. We are spending time together in the worship of our good God, breaking bread together, and eating our food with glad and generous hearts. May it so be so in each of our lives, in the glory, to the glory of Jesus our Lord. May we, in our breaking of bread, in our daily routine, demonstrate that happiness that is part of our religion, that happiness of being in love with God, of being, reflecting God in our lives in that sanctifying grace that Wesley taught, and that may that be how we live our lives each day. Amen. maintain it. We are humbly thankful for the presence of your Holy Spirit who walks with us each day of our life. Keep us always aware of this presence, not only in our minds, 
but in our hearts. May we be a reflection of your love for us as we relate to others. Following your path, shown to us by Jesus, we should not feel burdened by the task, but joyful in this peace-filled way of life. Thank you, Lord, for your redeeming power. Free us from any harbored unforgiveness we might feel for others. For when forgiveness and repentance flow from us, blessings and grace flow into us. We ask your wisdom to infuse those who serve others, that they may do so in gentleness and kindness, with your care flowing through them. We ask also for your comfort and peace to be with all those who feel challenged and perhaps overwhelmed by what they face. May they rest secure in your grace and their burdens be eased. We seek your direction in clear truth as we arise each day this week. May we rise grateful in the gift of life and a new day with whatever it brings us, be it challenge or happiness, obstacle or opportunity, may we be courageous in our hope and positive in our expectations. We celebrate with you, Lord, the transitions in, our, in life experienced in this season of our lives. We celebrate weddings and anniversaries births and graduations, and all of the things which bring purpose to our life. We even celebrate lives well lived. While we might miss our loved ones, we pray they are free of any pain and feel surrounded by love. We ask all these in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, our Father, Lord, Let us rise and sing our final hymn, How Can We Name a Love, hymn number 111.
Albert Altmer was, a, again, a Wesley scholar who identified 54 times when Wesley explicitly linked holiness and happiness. It's important to understand that this wasn't just an extraneous aspect of Wesley's teachings. This lay at the heart of them. When holiness is at the fore, happiness is close by. In a plain account, it is happiness that characterizes the ones who love God with all their heart. He is their one desire, their one delight, and they are continually happy in Him. God's will is for us to be all happy and holy and perfect in love, according to Charles Wesley. These themes are indecidable union. This is why Wesley can say without flinching that happiness is only another name for Christian religion. He went on to say, he who is not happy is not a Christian. Charles Wesley wrote, happy the souls to Jesus joined and saved by grace alone. Walking in all his ways they find their heaven on earth begun. Please go and live in happiness.